I'm going to quickly introduce our speaker today. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Zielchen Guo uh, from Lehigh University. She's an associate professor in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering at Lehigh University. Dr. Guo received her PhD degree in Electrical and Computer uh, Engineering from the University of Rochester and received the IBM PhD Fellowship twice. Uh, Dr. Guo's research interests are in the broad area of computer architecture with an emphasis on leveraging emerging technologies to build energy efficient microprocessors and memory systems. Uh, Dr. Guo is an, an IEEE senior member and a recipient of the National Science Foundation Career Award, the PC Rawson Assistant P Professorship, and the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory Computing Sciences Research Pathways Fellowship. I'm fortunate enough to have a direct collaboration with Dr. Guo, and thank you for being here. I'm very excited for the talk, so uh, feel free to start anytime. Thank you very much for the kind uh, introduction and uh, the opportunity to uh, give this talk. I just uh, make my screen like full screen. Is this still a good, uh, like uh, you see the entire thing, right? I don't see the, the I don't see everybody else. Oh, um, good. oh okay. Then I will just do the presentation mode. Okay. So um but so then if there's a question, please just shout out because I don't see Tim after I do the full screen. Um, sure. okay. So sure. So uh so today uh the topic I'm going to talk about is uh about memory systems. Um so it's about not general memory systems, but supporting special purpose uh, in memory system. This is a uh, collaboration work with uh, a students in my lab and uh, get sponsored. We, uh, we are fortunate enough to get sponsored by NSF, Intel, and uh, DOE. Um, so why why specialization, right? So um, there is always a dilemma between specialization and generalization in computer architecture because uh, we have been uh, pretty successful in generalization, right? So this is how uh, in computer architecture courses, you learn about um, high volume amortizing non-recurring engineering cost because the cost of um, designing um, the chip is pretty high and also making the uh, uh, deposition mask is also high. So you want to have uh, sold multiple um, like billions of parts to amortize that initial high cost. Other things like Amdahl's law also uh, says uh, that we want to make common case fast. That's also for generalization, right? So um, if we can make common case fast, then the overall performance uh, will be uh, good. Um, and also another successful story is risk, right? So the idea is to use fewer primitives rather than many specialized instructions so that the design will be simple and can cover the basis of um, different applications. However, as um, most law are uh, coming to an end, uh, you've heard of um, the rise of accelerators. This is because we can no longer just rely on general purpose to keep improving performance. Um, and fortunately, there is a large opportunity because of machine learning, because this machine learning market is growing faster and faster. People are uh, actually also joking about um, machine learning uh, publications is replacing most law in terms of exponential increase. Um, so this is a large drive because now we have a large market and we don't have to care about high volume for general purpose. We can care about care more about high volume for those 1% of application, right? In terms of um, among different category of application, right? So this 1% actually is having maybe 90% of the share on the market, right? So this is pretty good. That's why also you see a lot of accelerators like TPU um, and GPU also count for uh, contributing, but not as specialized as TPU uh, in this domain. Right. However, when you talk about the one percent, you can also think about the middle class, right? So that's where uh, other application uh, 
don't get benefit from. They don't get benefit from, from general purpose because general purpose no longer is giving as much performance again. They don't get benefit from those 1% market because uh, they're not optimized for them. So, but they, they are important too, right? So how do we accommodate for those? The idea is to add additional co-processors or augmenting instruction set to support those applications. Things like heterogeneous architecture and offloading uh, certain uh, important applications to those offloaded uh, specialized core is a good example. So that's how the dilemma can be uh, solved in a way. On the right hand side, you can also see the um, the uh, the example of uh, just a straight knife versus Swiss knife that can do multiple things versus doing one thing uh, pretty well. Right, so that's about computing, right? But if you look at... Um, Gaoshan, sorry, uh, we don't see the slides. We're at the first page. Okay, so maybe I shouldn't... Am I still sharing screen? Yes, but we are just seeing the first page. Right now still the first page? Yeah, so it's the title page now. Uh, uh, how about now? It hasn't changed, so maybe you want to stop sharing the screen and go back. Oh, uh, okay. How about now? Yes, now we see a slide, yes. Okay, uh, let me just also try to um, I advance to the next slide. Do you see the next slide? Yes, we do. Oh, okay, perfect. Right. So, uh, sorry, then I will just show this slide a couple more minutes. Uh, so, right. So then, um, this is all about uh, processors, right? But if you look at uh, microprocessor chip, ninety percent of the area is occupied by memory element, like caches um, and storage structures. So, what do we do with the cache hierarchy? Because um, different applications, even though they have different demand on computing, some of them require more complex cores, uh, some of them require uh, simpler but more cores in terms of parallelism. They also have different demand in the memory hierarchy. Some of them may have bigger memory footprint, some of them may require complex um, prefetching logic. So what do we do with that? So that is what I'm going to talk about today. How do we augment or support um, those applications that may not be that 1%, but are still important throughout the memory hierarchy. So today I'm going to talk about two uh, recent work uh, in my group and with my collaborators. One is about uh, adding a scratch pad memory in the memory hierarchy to support um, applications with special purpose. And the second work is about um, designing prefetcher to uh, help important applications in traditional memory hierarchy. Okay, so this first work is about the scratch pad. This is a collaborative work among three universities, Arizona State, Penn State, and Lehigh University. And my student Abhishek uh, is the lead uh, student in this project. Uh, so this project, we are looking at applications in different um, uh, domain. So one is security, the other is persistence. Uh, both of them are emerging uh, important application domain, uh, as you may have heard of uh, Spectre and Meltdown attack. So security is pretty important. There are such channels, people can um, infer uh, sec secret information just through um, looking at uh, cache access uh, and infer the cache access through the set channels. And for persistence, this is uh, enabled by technology. Uh, some of you may have heard of uh, persistent memory. Those are type of memory uh, that does not lose state when the power is switched off. Uh, they are built of special materials so that when changing the state of the physics uh, of the material, they stay there. And uh, they can be made uh, as 
uh, comparable uh, as in terms of speed as memory. So that's why um, we call them persistent memory. Uh, they can also be used as storage. And if they are used as storage, they are faster than traditional storage technology. However, when using persistent memory, we have to uh, redesign the, uh, the application to uh, make the best use of them so that uh, we actually reduce the overhead of making uh, transaction uh, persistent. There are different logging architecture or logging uh, structures that enables that. This work we look at um, redo log in particular because that's um, uh, as compared to uh, undo log is relatively faster. Um, so the question we have is giving a different application domain. If they happen to have similar uh, need, uh, we do see that there are similarities between security and persistence. In security, uh, it requires a particular range of memory to be protected. In persistent, we also need to identify a range of uh, objects that need to be stored persistently. So when that happens, uh, we, we have a sort of a notion of domain that's saying, hey, this is a region of data that need to be either secure or persist. And when we uh, go back and forth between secure and like not have to be secure region, we have to detect this transition. Similarly for persist, sometimes uh, this uh, log has to be persist. And then when it is reflected in the data region, it doesn't have to, we don't have to um, really, uh, we really care about the log itself. The log doesn't have to be uh, persist uh, when the data is already persist, right? So. Uh, things like address translation and identifying the boundary, those are commonalities between security and persistent applications. So when we look at those demands, uh, we immediately think about, thought about uh, Scratchpad because Scratchpad uh, is a software controlled um, cache, essentially. So uh, there is a notion of address translation and there is a notion of moving data back and forth between Scratchpad and hardware managed cache. So the question is, can we add a scratch pad to provide uh, functionality for different applications? If that's the case, then that's perfect because then that's like shooting two birds with one stone, right? Uh, we can use a small uh, amount of chip area to provide more functionality. So uh, that's the key idea, right? However, we are not going to use traditional scratch pad because traditional scratch pad has um, different issues. That's why you don't see them as prevalent as um, we envision them to be. Traditional scratch pad are purely managed by software. So it adds a lot of programming overhead. So we envision a small private, but partially managed uh, software managed scratch pad and we place it next to L1 cache. The reason that uh, we found that a private and separate cache can be beneficial is because if you look at hardware managed L1 cache, it is already complex enough. They have to uh, support associative search, they have to um, support coherence, uh, they have to support um, multi-porting, and uh, if we just say augment on the traditional L1 cache, it has to support the same functionality, then that is going to be expensive. That's why we propose to have a standalone scratch pad and only provide enough functionalities to the scratch pad. Since uh, we are targeting on a region of data to target on special purpose, we don't necessarily need it to be coherent. And uh, since we are thinking about security and we don't want people to know uh, or other cores to know what is in this scratch pad, we make it so that we only move data in but not out. So we don't have evictions and we can only invalidate data. Um, but we keep the associativity because that is where the software managed cache is not good at. The software uh, managed cache has to uh, do the address translations through software, whereas uh, we use it as a associative cache and use block granularity to do the search in hardware, right? So just like uh, hardware manager cache, we do associative search. 
but we also get rid of the address translation between the virtual to physical address space in L1 cache. In L1 cache, that turns out to be also a big overhead for uh, virtual to physical uh, address translation. So if we don't have that, we use virtually index, virtually add cache, then we need to worry about um, a non, uh, uh, alias problem, uh, which is causing the L1 cache to have to have either high associativity or multiple search. Um, so that is the third feature. And then the fourth feature is also leveraging the hardware cache. The one benefit of hardware cache is that it refuses on demand. Uh, different from hardware cache, software managed cache typically need to do DMA to load data ahead of time. That is causing performance overhead. And in this case, we use the benefit of hardware review on demand to reduce that overhead. So that's a key design idea. And uh, we allow the software to allocate ways to different uh, processes so that it guarantees isolation for secure application, for security uh, sensitive application. So now we have this standalone cache. As you can imagine, since we don't need coherence and we don't need to do uh, virtual to physical address translation, we can have fewer ports and we also don't have um, eviction, so we don't have to implement hardware replacement policy. So this cache is, is extremely simple, easy to build, and just by getting rid of extra port to do coherence, we observe significant reduction of area because as uh, may, you may have learned that multi-port uh, SRAM is, uh, is large, right? You have, you have to add additional transistor for every cell to enable multi-porting. Um, and we don't have um, address mapping, so we also get rid of some of the address mapping, um, latency and uh, hardware overhead. Um, and we use software uh, additional uh, augmented instructions to say which load and store need to access this software, this scratch pad memory. And finally, the way allocation, we use a hardware checking, uh, permission check uh, logic in hardware to guarantee isolation and prevent um, prevent uh, unintentional uh, access. And last thing that is also uh, one uh, tricky issue is that since we don't have eviction, you may wonder what happened if it's full, right? So in this case, uh, we don't have replacement policy. We don't have eviction. Whenever a, a set full is detected, we will notify the software saying, hey, uh, you have to um, do something in the software. So basically, this is a um, best intention or best effort um, programming model. So the software do need to know a little bit more about, say, the capacity of the cache to make sure that the intention, intentional, uh, they intentionally manage so that uh, it reduces the potential cache full situation. Any questions so far before we move on to uh, some use case? I guess we do have a question, so I can take a look at it. Do. Um, so we have a question from Jonathan Sharp, and he's asking how much rework do you need for existing software to work with SVX64? Is it, a simple adding an, is it as simple as adding a new plugin, or do you need to rewrite the entire programs? Right. So that's a great question. So uh, for certain applications, um, say uh, we, if we just want to uh, store the, uh, actually maybe I will answer that question uh, after I uh, explain the two application. Um, so, um, so, so let's first look at a application that's uh, involved a little bit more of rewriting. So this is an envision of how persistent application can utilize um, the proposed scratch pad memory. So in traditional persistent uh, trans transaction memory application, uh, say uh, redo log is used. Um, the modification is normally st uh, stored uh, in a dedicated location. And uh, what redo log does is that uh, it doesn't apply the changes immediately. Uh, it will um, look at what has been changed by the end of the transaction and then reapply those changes. A benefit is that 
uh, if there is a system crash, then there is still an old copy that is consistent. So for redo log, the overhead is really about figuring out what has been changed before reaching to the boundary of transaction. So redo log search to figure out what has been changed before reaching to the boundary of transaction is the overhead. In the traditional redo log lookup, normally a hash table is used for the software to do a quick search. So in this case, we envision using the uh, proposed scratch pad to speed up lookup table, um, uh, redo log lookup. So in this case, we have to replace the code uh, that is written for the uh, hash table and replace it by uh, storing the data to the scratch pad and looking up. So this involves a little bit more modification to the application. However, this is um, more of an effort in the library developer. So uh, this is a effort that has to be done by expert programmer, whereas for user perspective, uh, it is a change of line. Say I use uh, the library that is coming with the SPX64 library. So what? Uh, so ho hopefully that is a good answer for uh, some to 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 that uh, question. One uh, aspect of it, and now let's look at how can associative scratch pad memory help with um, searching or lookup. So in software hashing, um, whenever there is a so we uh, use a hash um, function to calculate where to store the say a particular redo log entry. And uh, after we found that location, we save it there if there's nothing else there. But if there is a collision, then we have to build this uh, link list to, um, to, to chain it. This is one way to resolve um, conflict. Of course, there are other hash table uh, conflict resolution, um, but they, they are similar. They all uh, typically require um, link list traversal to do the lookup. And in hardware, the idea is that we will just use the hash that is built in in the um, index calculation. So because hardware hash index calculation itself is a hashing, right? So uh, when there is conflict, as long as the conflict is um, less than um, the associativity, we save it there, right? Um, and when we do search, we will search them parallel. That is the functionality of associative cache. So that's how we can speed up a uh, software uh, hashing lookup by uh, associative hardware lookup. Okay, so next example is a security uh, application. So in security application, one uh, example is uh, AES encoding, uh, AES encryption. So when uh, when we use AES encryption, what happens is there is a, a security uh, a S box storing um, the the storing storing the um, the the encryption table um, and uh, accessing pattern to the X box can be used to infer the key so so that's why we have to hide the access to the S box and the idea is to use the scratch pad memory to store the S box because um, we don't have eviction nobody knows uh, what uh, accessed S box, uh, and nobody even knows that has things has been getting into this scratch pad because uh, we provide um, we pr provide strong isolation, and by using a scratch pad memory um, augmented ISA to do the load and um, store to the S box, we can uh, hide the access pattern. So th in this case, it is a simple translation to say changing certain load and store to specialized load and store. OK, so hopefully those two application examples uh, give you a hint on how to modify the application or how to leverage some automated tool potentially to uh, change the application to use uh, Scratchpad. So from application programming interface perspective, uh, these are the application programming interface we provided that can be used either by just general programmer or library programmer. And some of them are uh, also used by uh, system software. 
So user mode instruction include uh, SPX read with the address and that target register, write, um, and uh, SPX zero. This turns out to be an important application for initialization because uh, in typical application, when you do a um, write to initial location, even though there's really nothing you need from memory, it's still a um, cache miss, right? So there's a traffic from memory to load a block to memory. Whereas what SPX0 does is that we just create a block, validate, a make a block valid, valid and fill it with zero. There's no traffic going to the lower level of the memory. And um, we also have invalidation and uh, clear, which is clear is basically just clear the entire cache. Some protected memory uh, mode application that is typically used by system software include allocating a couple of ways on the as a scratch pad for a certain uh, application, the allocation, when there is contact switch, there's uh, contact switch in, contact switch out. Um, and for contact during contact switch, we uh, predefine a region of memory to save the value in the scratch pad for a particular uh, uh, thread. And we also have this set range to identify that particular region to save um, contacts during contact switch. In the architecture, we also have to uh, make changes to be able to differentiate uh, the augmented instruction. Here I did not show the uh, augmented ISA, but you can imagine that say things like SPX read is going to be compiled into a uh, ISA instruction that is um, doing load and store. So the decode has to be other uh, colored um, part are component that either need to be added or modified. For decode, we need to uh, be able to differentiate, uh, we need to decode this new instruction, differentiate normal load and store from SPX load and store. We have to uh, work on the load store queue to uh, reason about dependencies among SPX load and store and uh, traditional or uh, conventional load and store. And in this uh, memory hierarchy, as I mentioned, the scratch pad memory is a standalone cache uh, in addition to dcache, but it's really in parallel uh, in terms of at the level because uh, scratch pad memory is virtually indexed, virtually tag. When we miss in the scratch pad memory, uh, we have to go to the address translation to fetch from the lower level. So that means that uh, when we do the fetch, we also need to go through MSHR to uh, to enable uh, parallel memory access and to reduce repeating access to the same block. So MSHR also has to be modified to identify uh, load and stores that is having a target of the scratch pad memory versus the uh, original dcache. So uh, that's the modification to the macro architecture. Finally, we evaluate uh, applications, uh, not just in the security and persistent, but we also added embedded system application because that's where the uh, scratch pad are traditionally used to um, load uh, regions of um, memory to or data to the scratch pad and to guarantee worst case execution latency. So we also show what benchmark from that um, domain. Uh, we uh, evaluate or we estimated uh, this simple scratch pad, how long, uh, how much access latency it cost. Uh, it is going to uh, be faster. So with the same capacity as the dcache, uh, it is going to be either one cycle or two cycle faster. So in this evaluation, we assume four cycle access latency for the data cache. So we uh, think that three cycle latency is realistic, even though um, according to our analysis, um, the tool tells us two cycle, but we think since we add additional uh, scratch pad, the routing is not evaluated by the, the place and route is not evaluated by the two. So we added one more cycle and we also did um, this uh, sensitivity study to see if it is really the same latency as Dcache, uh, whether we get better or worse performance. 
So in this case, we evaluated three latencies. So uh, two cycle latency is really optimistic. Three cycle is more realistic, whereas four cycle is a head-to-head -head comparison uh, without any latency advantage. So now let's look at the uh, result. In the result, we normalized all the result to a baseline with a, a single L1 cache at four cycle latency. And but if you look at this, you may think we have an unfair advantage on capacity because we add another uh, 32 kilobyte L1 cache. So we compare with uh, two additional baseline that doubles the capacity. One is same latency, uh, which is actually not realistic because when you double the capacity, latency goes up. And then another is a realistic uh, high capacity baseline that has a additional cycle latency. Uh, in this chart, uh, we compare performance, which is the inverse of execution time. So higher, the better. So as you can see that uh, if we look at uh, the base 64 uh, four cycle, it is uh, similar to the baseline for most applications. Some of them are better. So this shows that for, those, for the application we chose, they don't benefit from larger cache. And uh, of course, then if that's the case, if you add a realistic concern on latency, they will get worse, which is the rightmost bar that has five cycle latency for a 64 kilobyte L1 cache. And for our SPX evaluation, they are better even if we use uh, four cycle latency, they are still faster, uh, especially for the security and uh, persistent memory applications. This is because uh, for uh, persistent memory, we actually uh, reduce the number of instructions uh, to, to change from software lookup to hardware lookup. And other applications, you can also see some uh, performance improvement even with uh, higher access latency. And for overhead, uh, this additional SPX really doesn't get uh, much uh, additional overhead um, because the simplicity of the design. And similarly with power consumption, it is also very minimal. As a conclusion, uh, we propose a scratch band memory to help with both security and persistent application. And it can also improve performance for certain application, especially in the embedded system domain by avoiding unnecessary rollback. Um, and extend and discovery the cache for computation that don't need to uh, use the uh, larger uh, L1 cache, um, don't need coherence. Again, this is not a traditional scratch pad because we optimize it for special purpose. It has virtual addressing, set associativity, and <coughs> it uh, fetch on demand, and it also requires a best effort programming effort. So before we move on to the next topic, any questions? I think we're good. I can ask a quick question. Um, so do you see a path in which uh, a compiler can figure out what parts of the program should be automatically deployed on scratch pack? like your back cache and the other parts of the program can be deployed are less sensitive in terms of security and other applications or it's always going to be something that should be defined by the programmer that's a good question so 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 i do see that there are applications that may be easier for the compiler to identify automatically uh, for entirely um, but most of the case that uh, we look at uh, it is very tricky to rely completely on compiler. So some minimum uh, annotation is required for uh, correctness um, and uh, especially for security and persistency. Correctness uh, is very important and very difficult to, to get it right. Um, and uh, But uh, the, the, the thing is in this work, uh, what we try to do is to minimize uh, the effort on programmers. So we try to just um, rely on certain annotations that this region of the data really need to be secure uh, or that part is the uh, redo log or uh, for uh, for a performance consideration uh, for embedded system say this part is uh, going to be uh, latency sensitive and don't need uh, coherence. Mm -hmm. uh, so we do believe that programmer know uh, 
lot to help with um, the design, but uh, the thing that should be automated, which we haven't uh, like fully finished yet, is to um, be able to say, hey, build this library and everything is uh, minimum effort from the, the programmer and uh, uh, we, we did uh, do a lot of, we, do, we did do a little bit hand tuning that uh, can be further automatic. So, so I think minimizing compiler, minimizing uh, programmer effort uh, is the key. Uh, not really have to, we don't have to shoot for like absolutely automation. Makes sense, thank you. All right, so uh, next I will also talk about our recent work on a prefetcher. So this is a collaborative work with Lawrence Berkeley National Lab uh, and uh, my student uh, Chao Zhang uh, is the lead uh, and uh, he just graduated and got a, uh, he's, he's right now a, a research scientist at, at Facebook. So for this work, we are uh, also targeting on a set of important applications and we are looking at how do we augment traditional memory hierarchy to make the system run faster. So this is because uh, we don't want to just design an entire architecture, new architecture for this type of application. We also maybe sometimes need to reuse the course to uh, do traditional processing or uh, making general application uh, run faster. So uh, this, this is a set of applications that you see everywhere, machine learning, numerical analysis, web search. The commonality is that they have big data set and the data set are sparse, right? Because uh, when the, they have a lot of data, not all of them are important to reduce storage. We don't store zeros. When we don't store zeros, we typically use a sparse data format and that causes irregular memory access. So as a result, uh, the data access is not easy to predict, but uh, we do see a subcategory of this uh, application that uh, even though uh, subsequent access is not easy to predict, but the entire application is iterative. So which means that um, it access the, the entire uh, maybe data set and compute and then repeat again to uh, bit by bit uh, improve the performance to converge, right? And this is, uh, this covers a large range of applications, including page rank, community detection, iterative solvers for um, scientific computing. So when that happens, even though uh, it's difficult to look at the pattern within the iteration, but the iteration uh, repeat. So the access pattern for the entire iteration just repeat, right? And typically they converge more than 100 iterations. Uh, uh, they require more than 100 iterations before converging. So that's a good opportunity we find. So uh, the key idea, as you can imagine, is to remember um, what happened in one iteration and uh, use that information to do prefetching. Prefetching is a uh, um, proactive fetching so that uh, we can load the data ahead of time before the data is actually needed by the processor. So um, I think we can uh, skip this um, slice given the interest of time. Uh, so this is an example of demonstrating in graph traversal. Not all the access are irregular. So uh, accessing uh, edge array is sequential, but accessing vertex array is uh, irregular jumping. And this is a small graph, so you don't see this being a big, big problem, but when it is a larger graph, you can see the jumping is significant and uh, it's not going to fall into a single cache block. So there are many prefetchers that being uh, proposed in the past. There are stream prefetchers that just prefetch the next line or constant stride, uh, looking at how uh, the distance change, uh, particular fixed distance, this is not going to work well. So two, uh, prefetchers that may work well for irregular memory access are uh, temporal prefetchers that prefetch by repeating temporal patterns um, and indirect prefetchers that are specific targeting on this type of graph workload, which prefetch uh, based on the dependency of one data structure to another. However, for all of them, uh, they reach uh, accuracy around like 70%. Uh, or below 70% and coverage below 70%. Accuracy is uh, the percentage of correct prediction or all the prediction 
whereas uh, coverages is the percentage of misses that can be covered by prefetches. So in this work, we, since we rely, we have a strong assumption, which is for the iterative um, workload. Our goal is really to reach 100% for both prefetching accuracy and miscarriage uh, for the following iteration. So the idea is very simple. We do recording for the first iteration and we replay that trace of um, mistrace for the following iteration since uh, we know that this is iterative algorithm and uh, the access will just repeat. So uh, so since this is a very simple idea, uh, you may think uh, then what's, uh, what's the tricky part? The tricky part is actually to be able to identify uh, what to record, when to record, when to replay, and to control the replay so that uh, we don't prefetch too early or too late. So the trick of identifying uh, which, what to record, when to record is uh, done by uh, software, right? So as I mentioned, I always think the programmer knows a lot about uh, the application and can help. So uh, in this case, we uh, provide a programming interface to the software and uh, so that uh, if a programmer is writing uh, a iterative algorithm and uh, it can, uh, he or she can uh, say this is uh, a place where we can use this prefetcher, do an initialization and identify which data structure is uh, suffering from irregular access because we don't want to make uh, the hardware overloaded by doing things that could have been done using just simple streaming prefetcher. Uh, so we re we we select uh, we allow the programmer to select a region or the data structure, and then we say uh, start, right? Start recording the first iteration, and then in the while loop at the end of every iteration, we do replay, and then uh, after the while loop after it converge, we will um, stop the replay. So and then the, in the end, we release all the data structure, all the uh, allocated space for this uh, prefetcher. And then that's the end. So that being said, you can see that programmer really doesn't need to uh, add a lot to their code, uh, and uh, we we can enable this uh, prefetcher in hardware. So another challenging part is how can we guarantee that we prefetch right in time? Um, because when we do prefetch, um, the tricky part is how do you know when the programmer uh, when the processor is needing that data? So the, uh, the, my student come up with this idea of uh, approximating the progress of the program by looking at cash, cash access count, because that is the indication of how much progress the, pro, the uh, application is going through. So just by looking at approximate how many uh, misses is corresponding to how many hits, uh, and that means ratio changes, but we record uh, at different window. We can say, hey, this is the amount of uh, prefetch we need to do after this many of misses. And that is going to give us a good result for matching the timing. If we don't have good timing, then what happens is when we prefetch something, by the time we need it, it may be already evicted. Or if it's too late, then it doesn't hide the miss penalty. Okay, so I'm going to uh, skip through this example. Um, basically, this is just showing how a uh, our prefetcher works uh, for a particular uh, window size, which is two. So this window size give us um, the number of misses we need to fetch, uh, and with reference to how many access there are. So we have a counter counting. By that time, we should stop. Uh, prefetching and wait for the next window so that we don't go too far ahead. And we evaluated this on a four core machine um, and with uh, this set of parameters, which are uh, in reference to a, a particular processor. Um, and we evaluated three applications. For three applications, we use different input. So there are two graph application, page rank and uh, hyper M. And there then the one additional uh, sparse CG uh, application conjugate grid, which is the iterative solver for uh, scientific computing. 
And uh, for the uh, two graph application, we use these four graphs. They have different features. Some of them are power law graph, uh, like Amazon, um, uh, Comcat, and uh, there is Road USA, which is a more low degree and regular graph. And there's also a random graph, which is a synthetic graph. For the uh, sparse matrices, we also use uh, different sizes of the matrices uh, to evaluate the prefecture. So uh, from the result, as you can see that um, we are able to achieve good results for performance, and we also compare our prefecture with other uh, state-of-the-art prefecture, including MSB, which is the state-of-the-art uh, temporal prefecture, and Droplet was the state-of-art at that time for uh, data, data uh, dependent prefecture, uh, and we achieved good performance. And uh, if we look at accuracy, we did achieve pretty high accuracy, almost uh, approaching 100%. Um, other prefecture couldn't achieve that high accuracy, uh, likely because they don't have uh, the same amount of assumption and uh, help from the programmer to indicate the region that is repeating. And for coverage, again, we achieve very good uh, coverage. Uh, one more thing I didn't point out is that um, we combine the RNR prefecture with a um, with a uh, stream prefecture because there are part of the data that is not needing this uh, irregular memory prefecture. So then we just say this is anything that is not going to be that is not marked by the programmer. We are going to just use. Uh, stream prefecture, so that is the blue bar, uh, which is RNR combined with a stream prefecture. And um, for timing, uh, we also see a good result for uh, the timing control. When we don't have timing control, the prefecture tend to just prefetch as much as possible and end up with a lot of early prefetch, which is the yellow bar on the left. After we apply the timing control with reference to a number of accesses, as you can see, uh, the on-time prefetch, the blue bar, is the majority. And in, on average, uh, more than 97% of prefetches are on time. Um, and now you could uh, wonder what is the overhead, because uh, we require recording and we save the recorded sequence in memory. So that generates memory traffic. Uh, so if you look at this chart, as you can see, surprisingly, our overhead is not as high as other prefectures, and some of them even lower than uh, state-of-the-art prefecture. So this is because um, we have good accuracy and coverage. So we actually reduce the misprefetching. So the other prefecture, even though they don't have to save a lot of metadata, they are suffering from fetching wrong data. So as a result, we require, we added uh, the RNR and RNR combined cost 12% and 27% of additional off-chip traffic, and uh, it requires 12.5% uh, of data input as metadata. And uh, also note that this is data dependent. This is input dependent. dependent uh, depends on the graph, depends on the matrices. This uh, number varies. Okay, so that's the end of my talk. Hopefully that's a uh, convincing talk to uh, show you that uh, it is a uh, promising direction to support uh, special purpose in the general memory hierarchy. Thank you very much. Two very exciting uh, projects. And uh, if you guys have any questions, the audience online here can go ahead. If you agree, Zia Chan, we might be just a little bit over time. So what I do usually, I ask the audience to send me their questions and I can get back to you with their possible questions to give them the opportunity to watch it again. Uh, maybe some of the slides, if you can share it with us. And within a few days a week, I can uh, send you some questions and I can share them with them next week. Do, does that work for you? Yeah, sounds good. Yeah, yeah, I, I think that's what we're going to do. I actually do have some questions, but I, I know that we probably have the room for another few minutes. Uh, uh, I appreciate the talk. As always, I enjoyed it and I uh, I personally have some questions and I'm very looking forward to more questions from other students. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs>